I mean, I've always been very technology kind of focused. Um, I mean, I've now worked for, in New Zealand anyway, not all of them, but the majority of the over the retailers are importers of Pro Audio. So, I mean, I met you at Music Works. I did the works for a very brief period of time at the Rock Shop as well. Um, but then also worked as a rep for a lot of those those companies doing it. So mm. helping people set up studios or sold a lot of pairs of turntables over the years as well. I don't think they sell any pairs of turntables these days, but um, but that's always been good because it I really enjoy um, I guess showing people how to use this equipment and seeing how people use the equipment as well. Um, and it was quite good. I mean, I got into at least selling DJ equipment just as the real DJ culture in New Zealand was taking off. That we would just we couldn't ha we didn't we weren't able to stock enough turntables in the stores. Basically, mm. they were always on back order. We've been trying to get the things. So that was cool to just see that massive wave as suddenly everyone needed to have a pair of turntables. Mm. Um, and then yeah, just sl slowly as you do. I mean, I'm now kind of out of working in that industry on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't work at a retail store anymore, but still I have a lot of uh, people I met and clients that I met through that who have become friends now basically. So you spend a lot of time just helping guys with the studio kind of issues or, you know, um, which I enjoy, it's the, it was the running joke is I mean I probably enjoy setting up a studio as much as I actually do enjoy using it. Hmm. Um, is that something that sort of feeds into the music you make as well because you kind of working with a whole bunch of different guys as well. Yeah, well, I guess it must, I mean, it must influence me as well, these conversations you have with these guys that you kind of go off and think, oh, I'll try that that technique now or I'll try that side of it. Um, on the other hand as well, there's a lot of guys I work with and, and talk with in depth about, I guess, studio stuff that musically I don't have a lot in common with. Hmm. Um, but I still find it's still a common language that we can have and they, they, they kind of know it's a mutual thing. We have our own musical tastes or whatever it is, but the techniques and the technologies that we're using are, are pretty universal for it. Hmm. Um, so from that point of view, yeah, it becomes just a common language. Do you think that's something that kind of pushes things forward musically for you? Because I, I know there's been, we've had sort of conversations and production stuff about you know listen to justin timberlake production and then yep. apply it to drum and bass yep. i know that's something like you've done with other people as well and and it's a phenomenal way to learn as well mm. um not that i'm a huge justin timberlake fan but you know. no but the producer and his engineers exactly. are pretty good yeah. yeah um so that's the especially i think a lot with electronica where there aren't as many as there, there are kind of starting up now but there's not as many established schools or or teaching methods that there have been, it's always been, you know, I think that's the other thing with electronics, like everything else, early sampling and stuff like that was taking bits from other bits and pieces, so production methods is just the same, it's like, you can hear them doing it and you know, it's just apply it to what we do. Mm. I mean, the other th on the reverse of that, I also think you'd find a lot of the guys who are producing that stuff, uh, they've obviously got their own musical projects as well, so, um, yeah, but uh, for me, it used to be a, a case of a lot, a new toy was always a new sound for me and a new kind of little journey sonically and then also musically. Mm. I'm almost again doing the reverse of that now and forcing myself to use just specific bits of equipment to kind of learn them a bit more in depth. Um, because you get to that, the, the point where suddenly everyone's just chasing. I've never really been a huge preset fan, but you, you kind of get to the point where you're just using something for one or two sounds and then you never use it again. And there is a certain value of just learning any instrument inside out, you know, because you go from having to find different, play with different instruments to find the sound to having an instrument and going, right, that's the sound I want, and now I can actually create it with this instrument. Yeah. Um, I mean, is that kind of an approach that you've taken, sort of, you know, you, Obviously, you've got this technical background. You learn yeah. a lot of these different sort of softwares and stuff. Is then stripping it back to just learning a few different things really yeah. well? Does that yeah, kind it, of I think it's it, it's a big thing. Is that you can have you know the the top ten voted synthesizers VSTs, um, but if you don't know a whole lot about um, you know analog subtractive synthesis, you're always going to be kind of limited to whatever's on the surface of those those instruments. Mm. Whereas if you kind of figure out what an envelope is doing and an LFO is doing and the filters are doing, how they actually work and interact, um, then you suddenly realise that all the synthesizers, they generally have all the same stuff in it and you can kind of take all of them and, and get 
generally what you want out of it you know they're all going to have their own little features and some have things that do things a little bit differently but um yeah i mean i now i use i think one one vst synth for pretty much everything um and in the the hardware and which vst synth is that <laughs> uh the the atura uh, atura um moog or moog modular. The modular or the mini modular yeah yeah, and that was also, I mean, that's that's another thing now, because I need more expensive hobbies, is uh, the idea of building a modular to me is quite cool as well, because it strips it back down to that concept of we've got little little aspects of, of the greater sound that we can just f literally physically plug together. Mm. Um, but also that particular VST to me has just got phenomenal uh, bass and sub-bass in it. Uh, I use very simple patches for it. Um, but the modulation at the same time for it is very, it's a, it's a, it's a virtual modular so you can kind of patch anything anywhere and, and try and break stuff and see what kind of sound comes out of it. Cool. Is there one sort of favourite bit of gear that you have that's always sort of been up there for you? It's important to sound or? Um, not Even though you get to approach them all the same way as they want, it's one of your favourite? Not really, they've all, they've all got their own little charms to them. I've, I've had a lot of gear that's come in come into my hands and gone through over the years. One, The one bit of equipment that I sold and wish I never had was my Sherman um, filter bank, which I've actually now uh, got Greg's one in the studio as well, um, just because there's nothing else that quite sounds like a, a Sherman being overdriven. Because um, you've been through a hell of a lot of gear through, been through a hell the, of a lot of gear, the studios yes. that yep. kind of yep. I've you know, seen. And um, going from, you know, big, the big, they had an old, I think it was old Radio New Zealand console, the big full size mm. console, and all external compressors, EQs, filters, and everything like that. Um, which just it got so hot during summer in that room, it was yeah. it was stupid. To um, basically realizing that you know part of it was moving as well, so I wanted to shrink everything back down to something I could kind of move with me. Um, I guess it's a one. It's the one. It's a blessing and a curse. Also, is working in the 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 industry where you you're essentially selling and buying equipment all the time, that you have access to a lot of stuff that just walks through a door that you just can't not buy. You know, mm. um, as as trade ins. You know, uh, the that SH one hundred and one was a trade in. Uh, the Roland synth. They had a guy bringing a Pro One that he wanted to just trade in basically on whatever because it'd been sitting in his shed out the back and hadn't been played in. 20 odd years or something like that. Mm. Um, so I guess also a little bit of knowledge is dangerous because you kind of know what that is and you, you do want it. Um, but, but funnily enough, for whatever reason at the time as well, I didn't really ever use those a whole lot. But now that I've kind of gone back to hardware and I'm looking at things like modular and the, learning more about CV and stuff like that, now I'd love to have them because I'd be plugging CV controllers and stuff into them. Mm -hmm. Um, my, I guess my ideal studio world is analog sound but digital control for it because mm. I love being able to save patches and, and having stuff that is automatable but nothing beats cabling and electricity going through you know, wires for me. Cool. Mm. Do you uh, use the machine drum, do you? Yeah. Do you, do you think that's like the best hardware drum machine out there? Um, I mean, it's not like there's a hell of a lot. There's no, and I, the the other the issue is as well in New Zealand, it's hard to come by all of these ones to have a real play with. But what's um, the new one that they've just released? Because oh, there is yeah. a new one that is a There's step a up from the machine drum. Dix has actually packed in and he tried to get it sorted out. Yeah, and it's been a big production. I don't think he's actually got it sorted out. I don't think so. It's um, I mean, uh, Electron is a it's a bit kind of a boutique company that's gotten a bit bigger as well. So. Um, I don't know. I mean, at the moment, I've got I've got the mach machine drum sitting there, and then I've got an 808 and a 909 sitting next to it as well. Right. Um, and even the sound of it, I kind of swing back and forth between them because certain days you can't beat the sound of the hi hats coming out of a 909 just because of the way it kind of swishes and everything. But then at other points, the the machine drum is just that cleaner and crisper, and and the kick drum is punchier. Yeah. But then you turn the 808 on and it just booms like only an 808 can. But then you put the 808 sample into a machine drum and it's just that little bit tighter and, and punches a little bit harder. So, what's the sequencer like on the machine drum? Because that's kind of because you're kind of I know you come from Yamaha sort of mm. background, yeah. eh? And Roland, yeah. 
Yeah. It's um, let's see. The sequencer on it is basically the same way that the the 909 would work. It's a 16 track sequencer on it, um, and you just go through your different tracks and and load them. What's What's kind of cool about it though is that you can go, each pattern you go through has got its own sound set with it, so all the sounds can change instantaneously. Whereas obviously the the, the 808 and the 909, I, I really just love playing with them because they're just so immediate. Um, but it's also nice to kind of quickly change into a completely different drum sound for me. Um, so, I mean, at the moment, because I've got the luxury of having it all there, I've got the machine drum is kind of is underpins it all and then I almost... Um, jam on that 808 and 909 on top of it. Um, do, you, do you ever find uh, with playing, when you're mixing up, just basically doing a show with a lot of hardware, yep. between DJs, what we found was, especially when we were DJing as well, the more we listened to recent band stuff, that doing a live set with hardware, your sound didn't sound that it yep. okay in clubs, but it was it just didn't, you know, a DJ would come on after you and suddenly it would just sound like amazing, yep. even though, you know, you, you're in full control of your machines. It just didn't have that kind of compression and the togetherness that, you know, and you really, between systems... Yeah, no, it's... Work. It's, um... I think there's, there's two things that have changed because that was always a concern for me as well and you'd read up everywhere, it's like, oh, you're doing live, you're not going to have that control, but... That's also why I'm at the moment I'm just going to be sticking with Ableton as my mix environment because all the hardware is going into Ableton and basically getting submixed where each of the channels has essentially mastering going on on it and then over the master effects is also pseudo mastering going on over the whole thing. So while I'm not smashing everything to death, there's actually a, there's quite a bit of EQ and saturation and compression going on all those channels before it comes back out of the, and the out of the computer. Is basically yeah, yeah. So that was, that was part of it, and then the other thing as well as I've even noticed is I think that a lot of that was happening when I was comparing to um, uh, vinyl and then CDs. Right. I know that my rig sounds a hell of a lot better than a guy playing MP3s. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, that's the or, thing. Or, or the other one is even the guys who I've seen doing the live, the live Ableton, which a few guys, if it's a cheaper sound card as well. Yeah. I've got a, there's an RME Fireface sitting there, so it's a good pro, what was it? high up a pro-ish grade mm. sound card so I know it sounds pretty good yeah and also um, if you're doing live electro and, and then doing live dubstep it's quite a huge shift in the amount mm. of separation in that music yeah. like you can get away with doing a live dubstep with quite almost rudimentary machines because there's yeah. so much separation and they love that deep punchy kick that you can't really get away with in a way in like modern electro mm. like if you're playing next to like a bunch of DJs yeah. like Serato you suddenly sound like it just sounds so it's um loud and kind of it was interesting I mean the few times I've played it I always go out the front and have a good listen and see how it compares to anyone else playing around me and generally provided it's set up provided the sound guy at the front and how it's set up at the front is also good as well if there is a guy at the front doing it you're not going into a DJ mixer provided that's all good I think um these days it should sound pretty good you know I mean I've got to put a gate over the 909 and the 808 because yeah. they do hiss quite a bit at loud levels and when I played last Friday there was a big ground buzz through the 909 as well which I was, through the gate I was able to kind of hide but um, but the main thing is that it's running through Ableton being sub yeah. with EQs and compression yeah, that's the and thing. I, some compression on the output yeah, as well because the, my thought was if I did it with a traditional uh, console um, and external compressors, I'd need a rack, like I'd need a studio with me to do what I'm doing inside of Ableton. Yeah.